Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Today is Knockout Opioid Abuse Day in New Jersey. So I appreciate all of you joining us for this town hall with Fairleigh Dickinson University. As I mentioned, today is Knockout Opioid Abuse Day. It's a day designated by Governor Murphy and the state legislature to mobilize our state for prevention, education, and awareness messages. So we're so pleased uh, that Fairleigh Dickinson University partnered with us today, along with the Community Coalition for a Safe and Healthy Morris, to have today's event, which was brought to you by the Partnership for Drug for New Jersey and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. As we um, begin this event, I want to again thank you for attending and your commitment to being part of the solution to knock out opioid abuse in our state. The Partnership and the Horizon Foundation for New Jersey are pleased to bring this discussion today, and I am so pleased to welcome uh, Michelle Guinea, our Nurse Case Manager for National Accounts Case Management with Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Michelle, welcome. Thank you, Angela, and good morning, everyone. It is my honor to join you this morning, and I would like to thank all of you for your interest and attendance today. I know that it is a very challenging time for everyone, and we greatly appreciate your dedication to continuing the discussion on how we can knock out opioid abuse in New Jersey, especially during this critical time. As many of you are aware, due to COVID-19, the Partnership for Drug-Free New Jersey has to cancel the in-person town halls. The Horizon Foundation has been working with the partnership to develop ways to continue the conversation and community engagement through social media and through the partnership's website. Today's event is the second of four virtual town halls being held in the next several weeks, which will be focusing on opioid crisis at the community level. Horizon, through its philanthropic arm, the Horizon Foundation for New Jersey, is extremely proud of our collaboration with the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey to bring you today's webinar through the Knockout Opioid Abuse Initiative. This initiative is part of our company-wide response to address and help end this public health uh, crisis across the state and represents a large portion of the foundation's $1.8 million that we have invested to provide support for opioid prevention and education programs to help families and our members. In closing, I want to thank Dr. Avaltrani for moderating, Dr. Zobler, Dr. Kernan, Dr. E.K. Lawani and Erica Shortway for presenting today. I would also like to give a special thanks to Fairleigh Dickinson University for collaborating with us on this webinar and to the Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey team for putting this important webinar together. Together, we can make a positive difference in combating this epidemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you to um, Horizon for your leadership on this on this effort. Um, it's now my pleasure to kick off our event. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome our um, and introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Michael Avalchani, the Dean of the School of Pharmacy for Fairleigh Dickens University. Good morning, Doctor. Thank you for joining us today and moderating this session. Thank you so much and thank you for your continued commitment to uh, I think uh, public health crisis of, of our generation and for being so committed to getting the word out and also uh, getting the voices of our community uh, to be able to weigh in. So we do appreciate being able to be a part of this with you all. And we thank you all for being here today to those on the panel, as well as those in the audience. So uh, without further ado, I, I think it's uh, worthwhile for us to spend our time uh, certainly learning about this crisis and, and having an opportunity as well to ask questions of our distinguished panel and to uh, collect questions as they come in from our audience as well. And I, I will just reiterate that those who are listening, please do feel free to submit questions via the chat uh, to make sure that uh, your questions are heard and, and that we can, uh, if as time up permits, uh, ask our panelists to be able to navigate those answers. So the first question, uh, just as we begin to, uh, to move forward, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. William Kernan, uh, who is the professor of the Department of Public Health at William Patterson University of New Jersey. Uh, and if we're going to just turn to you for a, a little bit of a, a different angle on this, could you please explain how the opioid epidemic is a public health crisis and how it should be addressed differently than previous public health and drug epidemics? And specifically, what public health measures have been successful in addressing the crisis and what other actions need to be taken from a public health front? Sure thing. So I'm um, happy to be here. Uh, 
thank you to the partnership for inviting me back to do one of these town halls. Always happy to talk about this issue. I'm assuming everyone can hear me, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm really aware that the audience today probably encompasses a large number of folks with lots of different areas of expertise. And, and a, a general question like this one always runs the risk of repeating information that people already know. So my apologies in advance if some of what I'm talking about is very basic, but I do think um, this, this, this set of questions that I've been given really paints a picture of why um, particularly this particular crisis is so important for us not to, uh, not to leave behind in the dust as other public health issues clearly emerge. We, we need to continue to focus on the opioid crisis because of, for many reasons that I'll talk about today. Um, I think there are three major reasons why, as a public health professional, someone who's worked in substance abuse prevention for a, a while and, uh, you know, works on a county coalition and runs a drug-free community program uh, in a major city in the state, uh, three major reasons why I think we need to always remember that this is really a public health crisis. And the first one is the obvious one, I think, which is the human impact. I mean, the number of people affected by opioid use disorders, as well as their families and the communities where they live and they work is just staggering. And when we look on top of that, of the number of people who are dying from opioid overdoses, it's, it's, an, alarming, uh, it's an alarming thing. Um, even with all of the efforts that we've put in place to address overdose deaths. We still have these large numbers of deaths in 2018, as many of you know. Um, 130 people about were dying every day from a drug overdose, an opioid overdose in the United States. So that human impact is something that's really important to consider. Um, another reason from a public health perspective why this crisis is really critical to keep a focus on is the economic burden that it poses to our country, but specifically to our healthcare system, our criminal justice system, um, and our treatment, uh, our ability to provide uh, tr treatment. Uh, the yearly price tag is estimated to be around $80 billion a year in the United States alone when it comes to um, dealing with the opioid crisis. And I think a third reason, and there are others as well, but I think a third major reason is that this has just been going on for such a long time. Unlike so many other drug crises we've had in the past, this is starkly different. This temporal aspect of how um, opioid uh, abuse has sort of transformed over time is really remarkable. In fact, it's been going on for so long that CDC, as many of you know, have defined three distinct waves of this crisis, uh, with the first one beginning in the 1990s with the rise in prescription opioid misuse. Uh, then around 2010, we saw that huge spike in the number of heroin overdose deaths. And just three years later, the third wave beginning with um, uh, illicitly manufactured forms of opioids, many of which uh, were derivatives or uh, of fentanyl. So this is really concerning um, as well. And it makes us think about approaching this in a way that we haven't approached other drug crises in the past. So I think the first thing, when we think about the unique nature of the opioid crisis, the first thing to address is the drug itself, because it is different in some significant ways from many of the other drugs of abuse. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, opioids are found in both natural and synthetic forms. Um, it's legally manufactured and it's illicitly manufactured. Some formulations of the drug, as everyone knows, have accepted in legitimate medical uses, which makes the drug much more, um, much more available to people and to a wider range of people, people for whom illicit drugs would likely never be a choice. So that becomes a, a real uh, feature that distinguishes this crisis from many of the others. And as I said, there have been a lot of prevention initiatives, many of which I'll talk about in the next few minutes. It still remains a major concern in light of all of the work that's been done over the last um, couple decades. Um, and when we think about um, prescription opioids and the illicit forms, the illicit forms of prescription opioids are much less expensive, or the illicit forms of opioids are much less expensive than the prescription opioids, which have become more, uh, less readily available in the public. Another thing that distinguishes this epidemic from others is, um, while all drugs have some level of intoxicating effect, which can lead to dependence and addiction, Opioids are particularly concerning for some um, real reason, real important reasons, including uh, dose and toxicity. 
but particularly as the, the adulterants that are often added to the illicit forms. And these adulterants or other chemicals that are added can significantly increase the, uh, the lethality of a drug that someone takes. And these are things that often people don't know are part of the drug that they're taking. So for those reasons, the opioid crisis that we're dealing right now really needs to be uh, uh, addressed in a systematic way that uses established public health measures at all levels, including health communication, health education, policy change, dealing with environment and the access, uh, mobilizing communities to make sure that they're involved in the process, as well as uh, partnering with folks that maybe normally we wouldn't partner with in, in another sort of drug um, uh, scenario, drug crisis scenario. So again, a lot of you in the audience I know, know about many of the, of the initiatives that have been taken to combat the opioid crisis. Um, but I do wanna point out some where I think we've, we've had some measure of success. And the first two that I'm gonna talk about, I'm only going to talk about briefly because I believe our next two panelists will talk about each of these in much more detail. Um, but one successful approach has really been trying to uh, put the drug that's used to reverse opioid overdoses into the public's uh, awareness, but also well into the public's hands much more readily. And that's naloxone or Narcan. Um, uh, starting about 10 years ago, many states started increasing their um, naloxone access laws for first responders. And in many states now, all community members being able to access this life-saving drug. And in many states, pharmacies being able to apply for a standing order so that they can dispense this drug without uh, an individual needing a prescription from a prescriber. So that's been one successful approach. Another successful approach has been seen in the treatment and recovery area um, with programs like medication assisted treatment and, and recovery coaching programs, which in the last few years have really emerged as a successful way to help folks um, navigate from hospital or treatment setting back to the community. And I believe Erica will probably talk about some of those programs. Um, other efforts to reduce um, uh, the crisis are really about dealing with access. Early efforts in terms of limiting access, particularly to prescription opioids, really focused on prescribers, um, identifying prescribers who were overprescribing, closing down pill mills or locations where there, were, um, there was just a, a, an obscene amount of, of prescriptions going out to the public. Um, and that those early efforts were successful. And more recent efforts have been about trying to uh, get the amount of prescription opioids in the community out of circulation, particularly those that are no longer used. They're either being stored in someone's house, they're unwanted, um, and programs like the Take Back Days and Project Medicine Drop Boxes uh, have been successful in removing significant amounts of these drugs from communities. And then, you know, especially uh, local level programs, county-based programs and municipal-based programs have really um, selected some innovative ways to work with non-traditional partners in limiting the amount of opioids that are in communities. Some prevention professionals work with real estate agents or funeral home directors, for instance. Um, these are folks who have some ability to educate the public about safely securing or disposing of, of unused medications, um, particularly because we know that for instance, some users of these uh, med of these drugs will seek out open houses and rifle through people's um, medicine boxes just to find um, the drug that they're looking for. Um, so real estate agents can can provide a a, a really important service to uh, the community by educating their clients about the importance of securing their medications. And then, of course, there's a combination of policy and educational initiatives that have been working really well uh, in the prevention efforts. Um, some examples, and clearly this is not a comprehensive list, are uh, prescriber guidelines and mandatory prescriber education, the prescription drug monitoring programs, and some innovative programs that we see in hospitals uh, where they're looking at alternatives to opioids, particularly in emergency rooms for pain management. Another thing that I think we've done fairly successfully but can need to continue to do is to identify high risk groups, a program that's happening in New Jersey right now that all of the county agencies are deploying uh, is focused on uh, young athletes as a high risk group. And this program tackling, uh, tackling uh, opioids through prevention uh, works with coaches and athletic directors and trainers and school nurses and parents to help them uh, 
learn skills to do early identification for young people, athletes who are injured, who might um, be at risk for developing an opioid use disorder. So all of these programs that are community-based have, uh, have uh, shown some level of success, but clearly there's much more we need to do as the epidemic is, is still sort of raging on. So um, in summary, so those are the answers to, I think, the main questions that I was asked in summary. But let me just close by saying that when we're looking toward the future of, of prevention, particularly in a public health approach to opioids, we need to maintain a continued emphasis on research and on funding prevention programs at all levels of prevention if we're really going to address this crisis from a public health perspective. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kernan. Uh, very, I think, comprehensive answer and uh, some really, I think, very important insights there. Uh, we'll turn over to uh, Dr. E.K. Lalwani, uh, who is a uh, pharmacist in charge uh, at Olden Pharmacy. Uh, and we're going to turn things over to him uh, just to tell us a little bit, as we have seen, I think, during the current pandemic as well, we've seen that the role of pharmacists continues to evolve. And, and uh, the pharmacist as sort of a community public health practitioner is, I think, a unique aspect that we're seeing already in uh, this current past six months. Uh, but one of the things we talk about regularly is potentially looking at pharmacist roles uh, in the opioid crisis as well. So if you could explain the role of pharmacists in educating customers on opioids and evaluating potential red flags for abuse or addiction that might exist for certain individuals, and then how might this role be different for a community pharmacist where there's access on a regular basis to a patient population who walk in? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I just want to wish a very good morning to everybody who's listening and watching us. I'm really excited to be here. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Uh, if somebody could give me a thumbs up or something like that, that would be great. Awesome. Dr. Um, so, as Dr. Alatrani mentioned, you know, pharmacist role has been continuously evolving, especially in the, in the pandemic that we're uh, in at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, it's the same thing with the opioid epidemic. And I, I personally feel pharmacists are significantly being underutilized because we have a lot of leverage uh, with these individual patients. But, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for pharmacists and then we can, we can certainly be a uh, team player in some of the major issues that we're, we're seeing as with respect to the opioid pandemic, or I'm sorry, the opioid, opioid epidemic. Um, so, you know, to answer the first question, so pharmacists are really, as I view it, the drug experts. So we are the prescription drug experts and we have a lot of the clinical information associated with uh, um, all prescription medications and especially with an opioid medication. So, you know, from the standpoint of educating your patient, uh, pharmacists have a huge role in helping patients understand simple things like why they take that particular opioid medication, what the purpose is, how to use it correctly, um, how soon to, you know, reuse it, um, all those types of things. And also basic uh, elements such as if a long-acting opioid tablet is being prescribed, then that's not something that you need to, you should be crushing, um, that you should swallow at whole. If you're using a patch for your pain management, then the instructions on how to apply the patch correctly, how to dispose the patch correctly, all those types of things, that's one of the biggest roles that pharmacists have in terms of education. Um, but also more importantly, as part of the educational process, is to help patients understand when they should be utilizing their opioid pain medications. As we all know, opioid pain medications have a, uh, have a specific role for intense pain management and also have significant risks associated with it. Uh, so it's often a difficult position for a patient to understand at what pain level they should be utilizing opioid pain medications as opposed to the other ones. And so it's one of the biggest responsibilities of the pharmacist to explain to them. My general go-to is, well, if you're experiencing a pain level between like an eight, uh, eight to 10, that's when you should consider reaching out for your opioid pain medications. And if you're not quite there yet, then perhaps a, uh, a non-opioid medication or perhaps even a non-prescription medication might be the way to go. So those are the, some of the basic aspects of the educational component that a pharmacist uh, participates in on a day-to-day -day basis. And through the process of education, you actually start identifying certain things in the patient that helps you identify whether or not the opioid is the best therapeutic choice for them, or maybe there might be other alternatives that might work better for the patient. And also in the process, you start realizing that there's a lot of potential red flags associated with uh, opioid treatment. 
So, you know, my biggest thing, and as Dr. Kernan already mentioned, is the New Jersey Prescription Monitoring Program. Um, that's something that I actually refer to pretty much every time I am uh, dispensing an opioid pain medication. And that's my biggest go-to um, software piece, a piece of, uh, you know, software that I use for my uh, red flag identification process. Um, also, you know, simple things like if the prescription was tampered with or modified in any way, then you obviously know that there was some kind of a uh, red flag associated with it. Um, if a patient or a prescriber is outside the, I generally look at a 15 minute ge geographical area. So if somebody's traveling more than 15 minutes to get to my pharmacy, then that's something that uh, typically helps me, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, push the patient in a direction where that, you know, opioid, medi opioid medication may, uh, may hurt them in the long run. So those are some of the things that I look at from the red, uh, you know, red flag standpoint to try to reduce opioid abuse and addiction and all those types of things. Um, the question of how community pharmacists, how this role is when you're a community pharmacist as opposed to a, a pharmacist in another health healthcare setting, um, you know, what it is is community pharmacists are the most healthcare, uh, most accessible healthcare professionals in the community today. Um, an average community pharmacist, you can just walk into a, a pharmacy. For example, in my pharmacy, my patients just walk in and talk to me directly. So you're getting an opportunity to speak with a healthcare professional one-on-one -on -one without making any appointments uh, uh, or, you know, having to wait a, a long period of time. Um, you can pick up the phone and quickly uh, ask for the pharmacist. In my pharmacy, my, my colleagues will, you know, put the patient on hold and uh, transfer the call to me. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things that community pharmacists, you know, have, have a advantage on because, uh, you know, what ends up happening is it gives us the opportunity to engage with our patients on a more personal level, uh, helps us identify their barriers or their, you know, their other health related issues. Um, and so uh, potentially uh, uh, the, the risk of abuse or even, you know, how, how, how well controlled the pain may be on an opioid medication, perhaps a, a non-prescription medication or perhaps a non-opioid medication may be a choice. And so those types of things, I can actually, I have that relationship with my patients and I'm able to uh, communicate that to them on a personal level. Um, and, you know, one of the things is community pharmacists tend to see their patients a lot more than an, a, a, other healthcare professionals. I mean, for me, I know I, I generally see my patients at least once a month, if not more. Uh, and so that gives us a huge leverage in the, in the health healthcare space to make an impact in our patients' lives. Um, you know, one great example uh, of this is the uh, uh, the naloxone distribution day 2020, and Dr. Kernan kind of referred to this already. Uh, this was a program that was just uh, you know something uh, uh, that was performed in collaboration with the Department of Human Services and a lot of community pharmacies in the state of New Jersey. And basically the idea was the Department of Human Services sent us a, a good amount of naloxone doses to distribute to our community members at no additional cost with no prescriptions required. And the best part was it was completely anonymous. So we did not even have to request for an ID or, any, or we didn't have to get any registration, none of those things. And through that process, we were actually able to dispense a total of 90 doses in a three-day period, in a three-day window, we dispensed 90 doses of naloxone to our community members. So that's just one of the examples of how uh, community pharmacists have a role in this uh, specific ep uh, epidemic. And in addition to that, community pharmacists have the ability to offer patients additional local resources, national resources, other helplines, all those types of things to help uh, patients with, uh, with the battle uh, on this epidemic. So yeah, that's that's uh, how I, in a nutshell, how, how I think community pharmacists can impact this uh, this this particular problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Lawani. I think that was a great great uh, insight into some of the resources that I think are very much front and center and available, really on a walk-in, 24-hour-a-day basis in our community. I think that's a huge part of of, of fighting this battle. I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Thomas Zobler, uh, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Morristown Medical Center at Atlantic Health. Uh, could you describe the effects of opioids on the human brain and how prescription opioids play a role in the opioid crisis? So the, the, the reason that question, I think, is so important has to do with a, a number of things. And I'll address the question in just a second. But, but there's still a significant stigma that we attach to addiction, and particularly opioid addiction. And uh, we need to educate everyone about the biology of addiction, because I think that's the most powerful antidote to really addressing the stigma that's out there 
in terms of managing addiction. So, you know, as I give you the, the explanation that the science behind addiction, uh, please keep that in mind. The other, the other thing to keep in mind, and we've already addressed this a bit, and we'll continue to address in the discussion, is that we, that we look at the treatment of addiction as a public health issue. For too long in this country, it has been under the providence of the criminal justice system and, and using the criminal justice system as a way to manage the, the addiction crisis that we have on our hands. And that has been, in, in, in my opinion, I think most people's opinions, highly problematic and flawed. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. And, and, then, and then finally, the, 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 the history of carving out the treatment of addiction from, from medicine, from psychiatry, um, we, the methadone clinics that were started in the 1960s, it certainly served a, a purpose and a role, but they were very much separate and apart from mainstream medicine. The fact that, that it's very hard to integrate from a regulatory perspective, that's changing in the state, but to integrate uh, a primary medical care, psychiatric care, and substance use care into one setting. Um, so there, there's work that's being done, there's more work to be done, but, but this is why the question is so important. So let me get to the question itself. So, so uh, what we need to keep in mind is that our brains, and we share this with all mammals, are hardwired to seek pleasure. Um, there's an area of the brain called the limbic system, uh, the hypothalamus, thalamus, amygdala, and it's the seat of our emotion, um, critical part of our brains. And that's where our pleasure reward pathways are, are located. And the reason these pleasure reward pathways are so important is that they mediate pleasurable Stimuli. So when we when we um, when we eat, when we have um, interaction, social interactions, when we have sex, these are things that are critical for the survival of our species. And these reward pathways get triggered, mediated by the neurotransmitter dopamine, and uh, it it ensures these reward pathways ensures that the pleasurable experience that we have when we do these things, it ensures that we keep on doing them. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's important to have these reward pathways in place and to make sure that we continue to eat, we continue to procreate and do the things that we need to do to survive as a species. And we all, as I said, all mammals have this. Um, uh, the other thing we got to keep in mind is that we have our own endogenous opioids, the endorphins. Uh, and those endorphins get, get, get uh, deployed in our brains when we hurt ourselves and there's an injury and the endorphins help to mitigate the pain response. They can also trigger these pleasure reward pathways. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's talk about what opioids uh, do. So opioids are perfect analogs to these endorphins that we have in our bodies, these endogenous, internal opioids. Um, at, the, the thing is they are much more effective at inducing a more, far more significant surge of dopamine in these pleasure reward pathways. So when we start taking opioids, you're prescribed an opioid, let's say because you fractured a bone, you're getting surgery and you need post-operative pain management. Uh, uh, what happens is um, uh, the opioids are consumed. They do an, a pretty good job at reducing the pain in the short term, but they also induce a significant pleasure response and, and, and really for some a euphoria. It's hard for us to predict with accuracy who is most likely to get addicted. We know that about 25% of people on chronic opioids will wind up misusing them, and about 10% of those on chronic opioids will develop an addiction. But a significant percentage of people, when, when, when you start taking an opioid, are biologically wired to keep on taking it. And, 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 and there's a compulsion to take it. And what happens over time is that the brain becomes much less proficient at producing dopamine. We, we go into a hypo, hypo, H-Y-P-O, dopaminergic state where we're taking the opioid now not just to not feel pain, not just to, 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 to feel euphoria, we're taking it just to feel because as we enter into this hypodopaminergic state where we're, we're really depleted of dopamine, in order to feel anything, we, we consume more and more of the opioid. And, and then what happens, there's the whole anti-reward pathway that's set into motion. Because these are such addictive substances where we develop a tolerance and you need increasing doses to feel the effect, and you can also go into profound withdrawal, the flu times a hundredfold, um, that, that, that we will then use the opioid to prevent the, the, the awful withdrawal that, that can be experienced. So it's no longer about euphoria. It's no longer about pleasure. It's a matter of just really feeling anything and avoiding that miserable, miserable uh, withdrawal. Um, so, uh, and this is what then leads to 
addiction, which is really defined by an overwhelming desire to obtain a drug and to have a diminished ability to control drug-seeking behavior. Um, and, and, and this is why we see people really destroying their lives um, uh, in the interest of, 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 of using these, these drugs, uh, the prescription opioids, and I'll talk in a second about the waves of, of, of the opiate epidemic, um, but uh, really quite remarkable. So, so how did we get uh, to where we are today? Um, so it's a, it's a compelling and important history that we need to be mindful of. Um, in the, in the, the mid-1990s, there began to be a push by a number of different players in the uh, medical establishment, pharmaceutical establishment, to look at the way that, that, that opioids were prescribed. There was a belief, correctly so, that these were highly addictive medicines that were quite dangerous. We've known about opioids as human beings for thousands and thousands of years. The resin from the poppy plant was extracted well over 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Sumerians wrote about it, the ancient Egyptians. Um, it wasn't until 1830 that the alkaloid was actually extracted uh, by a German chemist and morphine was developed. And he also warned about the dangers of morphine. So we've known about this for a while. But in the mid-1990s, you get Purdue Pharmaceutical uh, coming along and developing OxyContin, a long-acting ver version of OxyContin. There was a belief that that was going to be a lot safer. Uh, and, and in fact, what happened was there was aggressive marketing by pharmaceutical companies and by the medical establishment. Um, there were multiple players in this talking now about remarkably the safety. And, and what, what is so fascinating and, 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 and important to underscore is that there was one article that was cited over and over again in the literature. It was an article, by, it wasn't even an article, it was a letter to the editor in a 1980 uh, issue of New England Journal of Medicine by Herschel Jick. He had, by the way, he had no idea or intention that this was going to be what it, what it turned out to be. Um, it was an 11-line letter to the editor in which he looked at patients at Boston University Medical Center, and they had received a narcotic while they were in the hospital. And then he looked at what happened after they left the hospital. And not surprisingly, most did not develop an addiction. It was, it was really just an observation. It wasn't even a study. Letter to the editor. That winds up being one of the seminal articles that is cited to justify the safe prescription of opioids. And then on top of that, we have the, the pain societies, uh, uh, physicians talking about pain as the fifth vital sign, that we needed to do a much better job at managing pain uh, for our patients. Um, and, and because the perception was uh, ill-founded, as it was, that it was safe to prescribe these medicines, that most people were not become addicted, particularly if you use the long-acting versions of these medicines, like OxyContin, uh, there was a huge push. I can remember Joint Commission doing their surveys in hospitals and talking about how are you doing in terms of managing pain and that fifth vital sign prescribing opioids. Um, so this was what led to the beginning of the opioid crisis, this, this lightening up of, of, of the prescriptions and a proliferation of prescriptions. So we find ourselves now in a place where we, we are 5% of the world's population. And we talk about the statistic with regard to COVID, we're 20% of the world's deaths and 5% of the population. Well, we are 5% of the population and we account for 80% of all opioid prescriptions in the world. It's a remarkable statistic. In 2013, there was enough hydrocodone, five milligram tablets prescribed that every American could take a five milligram tablet every hour for one month. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary numbers, this huge proliferation of opioid prescription. So that starts in the 1990s, late 1990s. And, and what happens over time is, and as I said, there are three waves of the opioid crisis. That's the first wave. And what happens over time is that, that it's expensive to get the opioid. People need a doctor's prescription, uh, despite the fact that there were pill mills and there were currencies going on throughout the country of people bartering um, uh, for, for um, opioids. Um, it became harder and harder to obtain and, and, and heroin became much less expensive. So what we see in 2010 is the second wave of the opiate epidemic where there's a spike in heroin overdoses. And heroin starts to uh, bec use becomes much more prominent. Um, uh, and then in 2013, a, a particularly scary development where we see the synthetic opioids, fentanyl, 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Carfentanyl uses an elephant tranquilizer 10,000 times more potent than morphine. Uh, we start seeing in 2013 
uh, uh, more and more overdose deaths because of those synthetic, highly potent opioids. And that, that's, that's a terrifying thing. Um, uh, it, it takes a morsel of carfentanil, literally a morsel, to kill you. And, and what we're seeing through these pill presses where, they, where, where pills are manufactured that are laced with these things, and, and you hear these stories all the time about uh, uh, someone unwittingly taking one of these pills that they purchase on the street and then overdosing and dying. Um, I should mention that, that the opioid receptors are interspersed throughout the brain, including in the brain stem, uh, which modulates our drive to breathe. So when, the, when those receptors get triggered in the brain stem, it leads to respiratory suppression. And that's why there's such a fine line between, between utilizing these opiates for pain relief or euphoria, or as I said over time, just to be able to survive, such a fine line between that and death. Um, uh, and so we find ourselves now um, 500,000 opioid deaths since 1999, a remarkable statistic, 500,000 deaths. It is the leading cause of death for those under 50 years old. 130 people die every day because of opioid overdose. Um, uh, remarkably, I think it's the first time in 100 years, between 2000 and 2015, the lifespan of people in this country has been shortened by 0.28 years. Um, uh, 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 really remarkable, and that's due to the opioid epidemic and the lives lost to opioids. So remarkable, remarkable statistics. So let me just to segue back what I was saying earlier, you know, the science of addiction needs to inform how we as a society respond to addiction, how we respond to the opioid crisis. And we need to be mindful of the biology so that we move beyond the stigma that there's a moral failing here. Um, we also need to move beyond the criminalization of how we manage addiction in this country. Think back to Nancy Reagan and the, 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 the push to just say no, and how highly flawed that thinking was, as we know more and more about addiction and the hard wiring and the biology behind that, it is simply not a matter of just saying no. The mass incarceration movement to, to, um, to put people in jail for drug use has been such an, an abysmal and abominable failure. Uh, the statistics are pretty remarkable and telling. So in 1980, there were 50,000 uh, people in jail for nonviolent drug related offenses. By 1997, there were 400,000 people in jail for nonviolent drug related offenses. In 2013, half of those serving time in federal prisons were there for a drug related offense. Um, so as you can see, you know, we've done a, and, and, and I'm saying this sarcastic, we've done a wonderful job in incarcerating people who are, who are misusing drugs and, and um, it, has, it has been an awful policy and has done nothing to curb the opiate epidemic. So we need, to, we need to look at this as a public health, as we've been talking about so far. This, this is really a public health crisis and we need to move well beyond uh, the criminalization as a way of managing addiction. It's been a failure. And, and then finally, integrating the treatment of addiction into mainstream medicine, primary care, psychiatry, and not isolating it. And, I'm, and I understand that, that there has been a purpose and a role for methadone and the methadone clinics, but, but they were really siloed from the rest of medicine. And you know we've had the, the, the Drug Addiction and Treatment Act of 2000 and the development of Suboxone, buprenorphine in 2002 as a, um, a really a, a, an office-based alternative to the treatment of addiction and providing medication-assisted treatment that can be very effective to address the biology behind addiction. So we, we need to integrate addiction within, the, within mainstream medicine in a way that our history has not, uh, has not encouraged. Um, so thank you for that, for that question. Thank you, Dr. Zalbwood. It was, I think, a, a really impactful answer and, and sort of staggering statistics and timelines that, that are a reminder of how far we've fallen in a very short amount of time. So thank you for that. Uh, next question is going to be uh, to Erica Shortway, the Director of Recovery Resources for the Center for Addiction, Recovery, Education, and Success. And if you could share with us your experience with substance use and how it's been used as a tool to inspire individuals, and what sort of resources do you see available now that were not available when you started your recovery journey almost nine years ago? Yes, 
Thank you, doctor. It's an honor to be here today. And I wanna thank you all for giving me an opportunity to heal out loud and for creating this space to address solution towards community wellness. I'm a woman in recovery and I have been on my chosen recovery path since November 11th of 2011. Working as a certified peer recovery specialist in this field the past seven and a half years, I get to use my personal experience with substance use and mental health to help people feel heard, that they are not alone, and that we can proudly heal out loud. This inspires candid conversations to talk about experiences and fears individuals have had seeking reco recovery services. It helps us remove barriers for the individual's healing path. It's not always easy for me to share my most difficult experiences with substance use that I've felt so much shame and guilt over, but when it is met with a head nod or a me too, it creates the circle of identification that we are in this together. Being able to come through their wounds with areas that I've worked so hard to heal in me is truly what a mutual peer-driven relationship embodies. My dear friend Emily Monks always says our imperfections make us better peers. Regarding resources, my recovery has been very privileged as a white woman. I am seeing more and more not only conversations but actions being taken to make sure that recovery resources and events are available to all, including people of color, LGBTQ+, and other marginalized communities. We still have so far to go with creating safe recovery spaces for all. It starts with having more diversified experiences and the conversations around recovery initiatives in our community. Also that the conversations are not centered on one substance, but on all substance use and mental health issues that have impacted our communities well before opiates and that they are progressive and forward thinking towards solutions. Other resources that are available now that were either not around or not accessible would be this peer driven model in this field. Seeing peers as professionals sitting at the table, helping make decisions on what is needed to create true recovery wellness for all communities is amazing. We still need to bring non-professional peers and drunk users to the table to create a for us, by us atmosphere. That is the true philosophy of a peer-driven service. As a certified peer recovery specialist, it's important to be educated and aware of all the healing paths for people seeking recovery services, because what worked for me might kill someone else. We need to center more conversations on multiple pathways to recovery and not just abstinent-based recovery. At the Pennsylvania Harm Reduction Conference, I heard a speaker share that of the 23 million Americans in recovery today, only 2% are that of abstinent-based recovery. This speaks volumes. I am seeing more and more pathways integrated into treatment and recovery centers. However, we still need more awareness and attention on harm reduction services. Things like safe usage sites, safe usage kits, fentanyl test strips, never use alone hotlines, and more community wellness initiatives that honor body autonomy and the process to recovery. I thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to heal out loud and for providing this space today. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for those comments and, and I think for a very important message uh, as well. Uh, I know we had uh, passed by uh, Barb Kaufman, uh, the director of the Community Coalition for a Safe and Healthy Morris as we were having a few technical challenges at the time. I think we've gotten those rectified right now. So before we continue on with some of our question and answer, uh, I just wanted to open uh, the uh, floor up to her again to be able to address the group uh, and to talk a little bit about uh, her experiences and, and the role of uh, Community Coalition for a Safe and Healthy Morris. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, when I thought that I'd be welcoming everyone and, um, and thanking everyone for being a part of it, I am now, um, really here to applaud all the panelists and i i uh sat here nodding my head yes 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 to so many of them um michael to you i have to thank because i think uh, after you school pharmacy was one of the first venues that we used to um we started uh, education presentations about opioids i thank you for that for being involved from the very beginning um, and again, to all of you, um, 
just incredible information. I will say um, as Director of Prevention Services that prevention is key and cares. I've been honored to work with Angela and Angelo and everyone at PDFNJ on so many initiatives. But I'm most proud to have worked on uh, knockout opioid abuse from the very beginning, past six years. Um, what had started as a grassroots idea that we uh, threw out at a monthly coalition meeting um, evolved into a statewide initiative reaching tens of thousands of people and having been declared by Phil Murphy. Um, October 6th is now Knockout Opioid Abuse Day, Autumn and Autumn. So I'm so proud of that. Um, I, uh, I have done much of what, uh, what was talked about in the panel about um, all of the prevention initiatives that have got to continue and go on. Um, I have four pharmacists now. We've worked with them often on all of our um, initiatives involving youth, young athletes, and opioid abuse. Uh, so I thank them. Doctor, um, I, uh, I am amazed to hear all of the information about the brain. As, as often as I hear it, I just uh, nod my head a hundred times when I hear the statistics. Um, so I thank you for um, being a part of this. Um, and of course, my friend, my colleague, Erica Shortway, I thank you so much for sharing your story again and talking about the hope that um, that's there for so many people uh, finding their recovery. Um, I'm proud to be a part of, of CARES with Erica and, and all of us at PIC. So thanks again to PDFNJ, to Horizon, to FDU for bringing uh, these town halls to us so often um, where we are able to hear the perspectives on the problem from so many, um, so many professionals. Uh, again, I thank you. I am I'm looking forward to being a part of Not Get Over to Abuse for years to come. And uh, thank you again. And I apologize. Um, one of the disadvantages of working from home is I don't have my uh, young staff to help me with all this technology, but thank you again. I hope to see all of you soon. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you for uh, the over overview of uh, the important work that I know that you're doing that, as you've mentioned, we've, uh, we've seen firsthand and have, uh, have really seen the value of. Uh, so now, uh, without further ado, I, I know I've been seeing questions coming in uh, across the uh, presentation. I think uh, a lot of really important ones. So we will start, uh, and I have them sort of uh, queued up and in, in, able to hopefully facilitate a lot of the discussion. I will try and direct them where appropriate, uh, and then if others have uh, insights from the panel, feel free to weigh in as well. Uh, but we will start with a question for Dr. Zobler. Uh, how do state efforts uh, such as the PMP and the mandate that all patients are notified of addictive qualities and alternatives to opioids when prescribed have on the crisis? So the, the, um, the use of the PMP, the prescription monitoring program, uh, um, is invaluable. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it has been mandated now for a relatively short while. It's only been in existence for a few years. Um, and it allows physicians to really see uh, to what extent patients uh, may be going to multiple providers for prescriptions and has allowed um, uh, the, the, the medical community to really uh, manage that uh, as effectively as possible. Um, uh, I, I think there's also been, uh, both on a federal level and a state level, a huge push to try to uh, exert some control and limitations and guidance uh, in terms of the prescription of opioid medications. Um, and, and they have been effective, but, but, but not sufficient. Um, uh, so we have the CDC guidelines that came out in 2016 that looked at, um, at, at strategies for minimizing prescription opioid use. We know that, that the, the greater the quantity of opioids that were prescribed, so historically people were given a 30-day supply 
of, of opioids after surgery, well, now you can only get a five-day supply. Because we know that the more you get, the more likely you are to become addicted. Um, uh, we know that, that uh, the dose also um, is a factor in terms of who gets addicted. So there are now constraints uh, uh, legally in terms of what physicians are able to do. And, and, and there, there are, uh, there's a lot of structured support in terms of decision-making with regard to alternatives to opioids. Um, and and uh, you know, there's been a lot of, of innovative work that's been done in an emergency room setting, on medical floors, in office-based settings to utilize non-opioid management of pain, whether it's alternative strategies like acupuncture or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or uh, mindfulness meditations or injections or, or anesthetic patches. I mean, there are a range of interventions uh, and, and we need to keep in mind, as a psychiatrist, uh, I'm acutely aware of this, we need to keep in mind that, that, that there is a significant psychological component to pain. That's not to say that pain isn't real, but, but it gets amplified by our psychology. And there are interventions that can make a difference in terms of the management of pain. So we know 11% of people in this country have chronic pain. It is a huge problem. And, and uh, we we were way overzealous in terms of prescribing opioids in this country as compared to other countries, and we see that. Um, so there's a lot of work that has been done, and that's great, and New Jersey has some of the more stringent laws in place um, uh, compared to other states, but there's still a lot more work that clearly needs to be done. Thank you, Dr. Sauber. Uh, so moving on to another question that I think addresses a lot of uh, the sort of history behind uh, the, the opioid epidemic, and in some cases, some of the, as you, I think, shared, Dr. Zobler, uh, the, the sort of lack of understanding at the time. So for, for any of you on the panel, uh, you stated opioid prescription misuse, a couple of you, I think, had mentioned in the 1990s. And the question is, do you think prescribing at the time was misuse, or do you think the misuse was on the part of the patient or on the part of those understanding about what the, uh, uh, the specific were of the addiction qualities or other aspects of the drug. And then as a uh, pharmacist that practiced during that time, in particular person asking a question, they felt very strongly that they were acting based on the standards of practice and evidence at the time. So could someone weigh in on what's sort of the, the failings were or what the gaps were and, and what's happened to close them since then? Um, so, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that here's the thing. There, 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 were, there were consent, there was a consensus, a loosely shaped consensus in the 1990s that opioids were safe. The, so so I, I don't think that people by and large were acting in a willfully um, inappropriate manner in terms of the dispensing or prescription of opioids. Um, uh, however, there was a lack of critical thinking. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, there, the, the science was not there at all. There was, there, there was a history over thousands of years we knew something about opioids. We, we knew from the Civil War when morphine was used for, for treating wounds on the Civil War fields, um, and we saw soldiers getting addicted to morphine. It was called soldier's disease. We know from the late 19, excuse me, late 1800s, when it was believed to be a treatment uh, for anxiety and, and even something um, uh, where you have upper respiratory symptoms. And we started to see people dying in large numbers, uh, it, you know, that led to the Harrison Narcotics Act in 1914 and the illegalization of heroin shortly after that. Heroin was prescribed, uh, was manufactured by Bayer in the late, 19, in the late 1800s, and it was believed to be a, 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 a panacea for lots of different things we discovered that these were highly dangerous medications. And so for decades, there was a belief, appropriately so, that one had to be extremely cautious. So it was in the 1990s that there was, there was, there was a huge push to change the consensus guidelines, but it was based on flawed data. So there was a lack of critical thinking. Um, uh, I don't think people were acting inappropriately. That said, uh, there, are, there are lots of reports where, for example, it's not just the Purdue Pharmaceutical and the Sackler family, there are reports from CVS and Walmart sending to a town of, let's say, I think it was 2,500 people, uh, you know, uh, uh, 3,500 uh, uh, prescriptions for 
narcotics to that town and it being flagged. And then the next month, the same number of bottles were sent. Clearly, uh, there were pill mills, people coming from all over the country to get these. So, um, you know, there were people who were complicit. Um, uh, but by and large, I don't think uh, that that people were acting inappropriately. There was poor guidance. We were really misled by the professionals who, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, were not exercising appropriate critical judgment. And that was very unfortunate. I certainly don't think it was the fault of those who became addicted. I think that's a really important point that, that as you heard, the biology of addiction speaks to the fact that this is not a moral failing. And, 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 and there was an overzealous prescribing of opioids uh, in the 1990s and people became uh, uh, addicted. And you know, the, the opioids truly hijacked those pleasure reward systems in the brain. So I, I think it's important that we recognize that, that the people who became addicted were not to blame in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Anyone else uh, have anything to add? Or I, I'm happy to move on to another question. I just want to give every, all the panelists a chance in case there's anything else to, to reflect on or add to that. Then uh, we'll tackle uh, another question. I think that's an important and very timely one. Uh, a perfect storm of mental health, homelessness, and opioid addiction has stalled over New Jersey and the nation in the last decade. And it's now intensifying due to COVID-19 and we were making measurable progress on addiction until COVID hit, and now overdose deaths are up 20% in New Jersey and about 38% in Morris County in 2020. So the question is really, what do we do in terms of how do we engage colleges and universities, treatment facilities, the local community, and any other resources that we have at our disposal to collaborate to have a meaningful impact? I'll take a stab at this one. Uh only because, uh, you know, since I, since I'm one of the, um, uh, like Barbara, I also run one of the county coalitions. And um, I think that we have had to make a lot of adjustments in the way that we've been deploying our different prevention strategies um, because of social distancing and because of uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the experiences that we've had over these past few months. Um, but I would point out that it's not necessarily a new experience in the sense that in the world of public health, um, priorities change quite frequently. Uh, and oftentimes it involves economics and it involves politics. And it's up to us who are working on these initiatives to continue to shine the light on the importance of this particular crisis, to advocate for, as I said before, for continued research and continued funding. But as the question alludes to, at the local level, one of the challenges that we often have in public health is duplication of efforts by multiple agencies trying to accomplish very similar goals or objectives. And I think one of the things that we've done so well in New Jersey since you know, 2011, 2012, when funding became available to establish uh, countywide coalitions in each county for substance abuse prevention, um, these coalitions have worked very hard to make sure that all of the different, um, all of the different sectors that are involved in uh, addressing this problem are at the table. And uh, in some cases, that's been very effective. We've been able to do that very effectively. But in other cases, we continue to have difficulty um, recruiting members from some of those critical areas to help address the problem. So when the question you know, lists how might, uh, for instance, higher education institutions and treatment facilities um, collaborate with local communities, my response is the best way to do that is through a single effort with a countywide coalition and the prevention agency that, that is running most of those. Um, when we have a coordinated, systematic, strategic, initiative rather than a lot of dis disparate programs that are running simultaneously but aren't working uh, with one another, we have a much better chance of, of dealing with the issue and making sure that all the sectors of the community are, are involved. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Avaltroni, can I add yeah, a little please. bit to that also, if I may? So um, I, I think one of the other ways we can kind of uh, engage in this discussion further is incorporating other healthcare professionals who were not traditionally viewed as uh, potentially uh, able to help us, uh, assist with this uh, situation. 
Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge pro proponent, obviously I'm biased, but I'm a huge proponent of utilizing pharmacists for this particular uh, situation. Um, you know, I kind of referred to the uh, naloxone, day, naloxone distribution day in my initial uh, presentation. Um, but, you know, pharmacy has become one of the most uh, important um, players in, in, in the current pandemic from COVID testing to uh, dispensing, you know, investigational therapies, all those types of things. I think opi opioid management might be another, um, what's it called, disease state that we can potentially uh, include pharmacists in and uh, help with the education process for prevention of uh, opioid abuse. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of different players that who, who haven't traditionally been a participant in this uh, specific problem, but I think now might be a good time, given all the other issues that are going on, now might be a good time to kind of brainstorm that, that as well. That's, that's important. And I think one of the things we're seeing is that, you know, some of the challenges of, of COVID hopefully will also lead to maybe some opportunities of what we've learned in the midst of this time where people have struggled to have access uh, in a traditional sense. What can be an access point that maybe we haven't tapped into, whether it's through telephonic or telemedicine, whether it's through going to places that they have not typically gone before and then making sure that they're well cared for and, and well, well treated when they are, are seeking these treatment plans out. Could I, I just want to add, if I may, just uh, one more comment Please. about that question. Um, the, the other thing I think we, we need to do is, is, is change the culture within medicine. Um, because, uh, um, you know, in, in medicine, as I was saying earlier, there's been a sense of keeping the treatment of addiction at, at arm's distance. And, and uh, we now have evidence-based treatments that are, are, are quite effective. We know that the relapse rate is remarkably high in people who are, let's say, using heroin and they try to, uh, uh, they go into a detox and then they go off the, the, the narcotic, um, the relapse rates are as high as 97% within a short period of time. And uh, we know that that relapse rate can go down substantially with prescribing a buprenorphine. Um, and, and, and so when, when, when I was referring to the lack of critical thinking, you know, here's another uh, example of where the policy is not keeping up with the science and the reality of, 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 of the biology of, of, of the treatment of addiction. So um, uh, it, the federal gov government requires that all physicians go through a, 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 an educational process. It's not a bad thing per se, but it requires eight hours of training. Doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, and, and then a number of, of, of things that physicians have to do in order to prescribe Suboxone. So on the one hand, that doesn't sound so bad. On the other hand, it's a big problem because it, it, it creates a chilling barrier for physicians getting these waivers and for health systems to really integrate the treatment of addiction into the primary care setting and into the medical setting. Um, and, and the irony is that buprenorphine is a partial agonist for the mu opioid receptor has a ceiling effect. So you're really not terribly likely to overdose and die. Um, uh, it's, it's probably the safest narcotic uh, that we have because of that ceiling effect, the partial agonist effect. And, um, and yet, you don't need any training to prescribe any other opioid. Any physician can prescribe an opioid, um, except for suboxone. So there's really an illogicality to that. It just doesn't make sense. And when we look at countries like France that, that, that stopped those requirements in the 1990s, they managed their opioid uh, crisis much more effectively and much more quickly than we did. So part of this is changing the culture so that we really are looking at developing ways to do buprenorphine induction and treatment in primary care settings and in general medical settings. Uh, um, part of that also is working with the state. And I know that there's a lot of movement right now to have a single point of licensure so we can integrate primary care, medical care, and substance use treatments in one setting. Right now, there are separate licenses for each. And it's been very hard historically to integrate those services. So we need to move forward to make the care more accessible. Only one in 10 people with an addiction actually get treatment for that addiction. Uh, so 90% of people with an addiction do not get treatment. Um, so we've got to make it more accessible, more available. We've got to recognize the safety of, of, of buprenorphine uh, and, and make that much more available uh, to people and to work on the stigma that is not just impacting people's reluctance to go on buprenorphine if you haven't 
addiction, but the medical community as well, because it's, it, you know, there is clearly a culture of keeping this at arm's distance. Thank you. I, I think those were all great insights. And I think what it responds to is what we're hearing, I think, across all of the comments, which is that it really needs to be a cultural shift in, in every aspect of what we're doing here. And, and in those same, some, same lines, I think, uh, to, turning to Erica, uh, one of the areas I think that we, we see as a, a cultural shift that's an important one is the involvement of peer-to-peer uh, -peer services. So can you tell us a little bit about how peer-to-peer -peer services and peer recovery can help individuals on their recovery journey? Yes, thank you, doctor. Uh, I feel it's important to say that, you know, peer-to-peer -peer services and peers like myself, you know, we are the data. We, we are at the table and helping be the voice for ourselves. And that's so crucial. Um, you know, what I've seen thus far, especially through COVID, um, is many of my peers passing away with, with long-term recovery long-term recovery. That is chilling for someone like myself with almost nine years that I am an arm length away from making that same decision, right? And so having communities and in, in recovery um, environments that support us is so critical. This is what I talk about regarding harm reduction. Um, one of the measures we, we took through COVID here at Prevention is Key Cares is safe usage kits, fentanyl test strips, condoms, you know, not just Narcan and going out into, you know, uh, areas um, in certain counties that are individuals that are struggling, that we were able to get them and go direct contact, as my colleague Kelly Labar says, boots to the ground and hand out these kits. Um, one, it's, it's, it's respecting where they're at, right? But two, it's building trust and allowing them to feel safe with us as peers. Um, a lot of times when we seek out individuals to come to the table, that table might look scary. That table might look intimidating if it's faces they do not trust, if it's experiences that people at the table have that are not like theirs. So involving more peers at the table, so then it then draws in more individuals that are you know, actively using or problematic usage. Um, is so critical. Uh, I'm really proud of the state of New Jersey for a lot of what we've done here with implementing peers in so many programs, um, particularly here in Morris County. Um, this is where my recovery process was birthed and where I got involved in a professional aspect of peer service. Seeing it involved in the hospitals, seeing it evolved, you know, side by side with the prosecutor's office, uh, as well as you know, Hope One with the Sheriff's Department here is amazing. I mean, we still have so far to go. And I think that angle is gonna be peer-driven harm reduction services. Thanks for asking. Thank you, thank you. And I think all very important aspects and I think uh, valuable, as you said, sort of firsthand information. I think that we, we oftentimes overlook the most important parts of the real stories of people who are experiencing and have experienced uh, the impacts both sides. So thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Kernan, a question about uh, public health. Uh, what are some public health measures that have been successful in treating opioid addiction? And are there any that you believe should be either introduced or in some way expanded? So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, in public health, we, uh, we certainly think about um, the systems for, for treatment of of illnesses and conditions, we tend to work more on the prevention aspect of uh, and form uh, programs and policies around prevention aspects. But I think many of the um, many of the areas overlap when it comes to effective treatment. And I think Dr. Zobler just talked about a bunch of uh, of uh, treatments involving medication and uh, assisted. Uh, medication therapy that have been shown to be pretty effective in the academic and the research literature. Um, and we can't emphasize enough the importance of the peer recovery programs um, that uh, in New Jersey have, especially in Northern and Central New Jersey, which I'm more familiar with, which have been implemented so well to help people transition from clinical settings, particularly from that important uh, time in the emergency room where someone has been treated for an overdose, but has not yet made the decision, maybe they're not in a mental space right now, to accept the fact that they have an illness or that they need support or treatment. Having somebody um, 
like a, a peer recovery specialist, enter the emergency room who has been through that same experience, has been shown to be very effective at getting people into treatment. And as almost all the panelists said, treatment is complicated when it comes to opioid use disorders because relapse is such a prevalent issue. Unlike a lot of health issues where um, the treatment uh, trajectory is much different when it comes to um, drug use disorders and particularly opioids, um, the treatment aspect is complicated by the fact that this drug is doing something in, in someone's brain and in their body that um, is serving a purpose. And I think, you know, when it comes to drugs of abuse in general, we need to recognize the fact that for the person who is choosing to use them, um, they are satisfying a need that they have at that time. And uh, as, as many of the panelists said, if we are not addressing the underlying issues in society, which are causing people to, um, to misuse drugs, then uh, we are not using a public health approach to, um, to uh, uh, dealing with the problem. Thank you. I, I agree. And, and I think it's important uh, that we kind of continue to look to expand all, all, in all aspects. Uh, and in a similar question uh, from the, the group, uh, how can pharmacies continue to get involved in expanding uh, their scope of uh, addressing the crisis? And in some cases, uh, looking at new and innovative ways maybe to evolve and, and develop programs or, or access points uh, within the community. So Dr. Lalawani. Sure, so uh, I'm sure Dr. Alatrani, you will agree that when, uh, when students are trained in pharmacy school, they're trained as clinicians, but when they actually get to the real world, um, it all becomes very product focused and uh, prescri prescription dispensing focused and, and those types of things. And I think that model is slowly and steadily changing. So, you know, we, we, come, we come into the real world with a lot of education about prescription medication, but then it becomes about, well, if you don't dispense the medication, then it's not really going to be valuable for you as a, as a, uh, a healthcare professional. And I think that's, that's the paradigm that needs to shift. We need pharmacists to move in the direction of providing more clinical services so then we can provide the necessary education that goes along with the prescription drug or maybe sometimes there might not be a prescription drug. A great example is the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of testing is being performed by pharmacists. There's no prescription drug there. It's just a nasal swab that the pharmacist administers to the patient. And so a similar format needs to be um, implemented for uh, the opioid crisis as well. Uh, you know, pharmacists can offer uh, Narcan training, for example, for individuals who'd like to learn how um, they should administer Narcan. Um, you know, there are other educational components, you know, what, what uh, non-prescription medications can be chosen at what level of pain. Um, so the more, uh, I guess the way the insurance reimbursements work today, it's very focused on product dispensing. But as these processes change and, and more pharmacists take on a more clinical role, um, I think pharmacy will be a, a, a very important player moving forward for this particular situation. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an important shift as well. So uh, one last question, and we'll go around, around the panel uh, in terms of just uh, some reflection being obviously that today is uh, October 6th as designated Knockout Opioid Abuse Day. Uh, a day of awareness and education to addressing the opioid crisis has been identified. So in closing, what's the one last thought that you wish to share to help attendees to help them as they battle this crisis in their own communities? And so uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Zobler, and I'll, I'll just uh, go around with to each of you for a, a brief answer. So, you know, as, as I think we've all talked about, I think that, that part of this is just, um, you know, disseminating uh, uh, information about addiction um, uh, and, and really continuing to challenge and fight that stigma so that, that, that um, one, that people are aware that there is treatment, um, uh, that there's evidence-based treatment, um, uh, uh, encouraging the medical community um, through activism and lobbying to uh, continue to expand uh, the availability of treatment for addiction because it's not what it needs to be. Um, and I think we need the community to uh, advocate for that. Um, there are certainly advocates within the medical community, but the, the community at large, I think that's going to be very critical. And I think also helping to 
um, uh, erase or, or, or diminish the stigma attached to medication-assisted treatment, the idea that, well, you're just swapping one uh, drug for another, and in fact, uh, that's probably not the best way of looking at this, that, that we know that, that, that the brain needs time, needs time to heal and that the use of medications like Suboxone is absolutely critical uh, to do so. So I, I think that, that, um, that education and disseminating information, uh, lobbying to, to encourage greater support, and then also um, looking at harm reduction so that everyone uh, uh, should have, uh, if they have any prescription for narcotic in their home, should always have Narcan in their home. There should be wide distribute, continue to be wide distribution of that and all the harm reduction programs. And, and then also to have an awareness, as we've talked about, for the community services and the peer recovery services and the importance of that. So I, I think it's really just a matter of informing ourselves and then informing others and hopefully shifting the culture. Thank you. And uh, to, to the other panelists, to Erica, we'll, we'll turn to you next. Yes, thank you, doctor. Uh, so, you know, I feel that, you know, moving forward and, and having more forward thinking solutions, uh, it's so important to, you know, um, with the Narcan free days we just had to know that Narcan is free, you know, particularly at my agency every day, we were out there in the community giving it out. Um, New Jersey, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services um, has provided three different agencies uh, in New Jersey from North, Central, and Southern to give out Narcan to the community. Um, so that's extremely important. Um, more mobile units that are able to bring services to people. Um, that's so important. And more mobile units that embrace and supply harm reduction. Um, you know, that is really, I think, the angle that is working in several other countries. Um, you know, so to see more programs like that implemented here is important. Uh, Peer-driven conversations at the table that involve not only uh, professional peers, but um, non-professional peers and drug users. I think that's very important too, to have those voices heard, uh, as well as, you know, we talk a lot about treatment and treatment is so, so important, but treatment is just an event. So, you know, to create recovery ecosystems, as my friend Mariel Huffnagle always says, um, is crucial, where we can provide atmospheres and, um, you know, initiatives in the community that don't have an end date, that are continued, that people can feel a part of, no matter where they're at in their path, um, is so important. I'm, I'm proud to say at Prevention is Key Cares here at our recovery centers that, you know, we, we serve eight different counties. We work to do that, to provide those types of community settings um, where everyone in the community, not just individuals that use, but others, um, or have a voice in this. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Lalwani. So I'm going to basically mirror what the other panelists have said. I think there are two major things that I, I would say we should focus on. One that, you know, that Dr. Zabler mentioned already is we need to understand that opiate addiction, the stigma associated with opiate addiction uh, needs to go away, that we need to look at these individuals not as drug addicts but really as individuals suffering a medical condition that needs to be treated effectively and it's going to take time we need to provide everything we have on all levels the healthcare level government level you know family level all those aspects we need to offer our patients our care and all the evidence-based uh, therapies available so we can better care for them and the second thing I think is every individual should view Narcan as a life-saving therapy and they should learn how to utilize it. I think it needs to be out there in the community. I think Erica went over that already. You know, she's, she's trying very hard to make sure every individual in her community has access to it. I think we need to, we need to view this as a EpiPen or a CPR type, uh, you know, a, a product because that's really what it is. It saves lives and we all need to know exactly how to use it. So those would be my top two points. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Kernan. Yeah, I would echo everything everyone already said and briefly just say in response to how we can keep the momentum going. If you're someone who's not currently aware of or involved in your countywide coalition, 
uh, this is a great opportunity for you to figure out what your role in that might be because every New Jersey citizen has a role in their countywide prevention efforts. If you don't know how to contact your countywide coalition or the prevention agency that runs it, you can easily go on to the New Jersey Prevention Network's web, uh, website, njpn.org, and find out where the coalition is in your county. And then finally, I would say um, that uh, echoing what I said before about the importance of research and continued prevention efforts, that is intimately connected in the public health arena with the political arena. And we need to continue to advocate for those leaders in our lo local uh, neighborhoods, in our state, and in our, in our na nation who have committed to continuing to fund um, prevention efforts at all levels for this pro problem. Thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists and, and I think for the valuable uh, information and, and insights that you provided. Uh, and I just want to, at this point, uh, turn the floor over to Angela Conover from a Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey for some closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Albatroni. Um, and thank you so much to our panelists. All of you were, were excellent and your comments were so on point. Um, so really appreciate your participation today. Appreciate the participation of all of our attendees. I know some of you are looking for additional credits. Um, so there's information on the screen right now. You can visit drugfreemj.org slash FDU um, to get information on the survey that you need to complete to receive those credits. Um, I want to once again thank Fairleigh Dickinson University for all of your support and leadership in the planning of this event. Obviously the Horizon Foundation for New Jersey um, for the support of all of the Knockout Open Abuse Town Hall series, all of our attendees, and especially our Knockout Day uh, partners at uh, Morris County Prevention is Key and the Community Coalition for Safe and Healthy Morris. You'll see a uh, evaluation on your screen right now. I appreciate that you could take that. Um, all of our attendees could take that to let us know how um, you found this event, and you'll also be receiving an email with additional information and follow-up. So I want to thank you again all for being part of this event. Thank you again to our panelists. And um, if everyone can visit uh, drugfreenj.org and get a message out of the digital toolkit for Knockout Opioid Abuse Day to share in your community, uh, to get a message out, I appreciate that if you could do that today. Um, once again, thank you so much and everyone have a good day. Be well.